Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Thursday, December 9th, 2021. Once again, I'm so happy to be back with Professor Edre Goins. Edre, great to see you as always. Yeah, it's great to be back. Edre, we left last time. You were talking about some of your social and cultural motivations for leaving Purdue, leaving even an R1 institution. On the research and on the technical side, I wonder what that might tell us about where you were at this stage in your career in terms of not needing to be at an R1 school anymore. So to go back even further, when you were explaining your reasons for coming to Purdue, wanting to be in a center of number theory, I wonder what we might divine from at that later stage in your career, thinking about leaving a place like Purdue, what might that tell us about where you were in the research, both for yourself and in terms of the community of mathematicians that you were engaged with at that point? Well, let's see. This year that we're talking about would be roughly 2017, 2018. I received tenure in 2010. So, so I guess we should probably go back then to kind of explain where my mindset was. When I started at Purdue in 2004, I worked in an area, as I mentioned before, that was looking at this conjecture by Emil Arden, this idea of looking at Galois representations and how they're all related to elliptic curves. By about 2008, 2009, I was realizing that I really wasn't happy working in this field. It wasn't so much the research. It was more dealing with the personalities. Um, it was a very competitive area. There were a lot of really big names, folks that were in their 60s, 70s, and 80s that were still publishing in this area. And I just felt that it was too competitive, and the people who were doing well were just people I just didn't like, to be honest. This meant I wasn't happy going to conferences. I wasn't comfortable emailing people just to ask for advice. Um, and I was feeling more and more disconnected from this research area. By 2009, 2010, I made a very risky move and decided pretty much as I was going in for tenure, I was going to switch fields. Now, for most people, that's like the kiss of death. You, you know, really the year that you go up for tenure, people are going to write letters for you based on the research that you've done in that specific area, the work that you've done over the last six years or so. I decided I wanted to go into a different area because I didn't like the personalities. I wasn't happy working in that area, wasn't happy going to conferences. And so I just decided I was going to work in a completely different project, something I had not really thought of before, but it was something that I found to be intriguing. That summer, roughly June 2010, I led a research group of faculty at a research facility in Providence, Rhode Island, where we worked on this project that I had never thought of before. I spent about maybe three weeks kind of reading the literature as much as I could. But then I said to the people that I met for the first time for those five days, I don't know much about this area, but we're all going to work in this area together and try our best to learn it together. That re-energized my love of mathematics. These were faculty members that were all minorities. They themselves had not worked in this area and they worked in completely different areas. They were no longer in the number theory, representation theory realm that I worked in. They were all over the place. We're talking topology, um, analysis, group theory. One person was in number theory, applied math. These are typically areas in the field that have nothing to do with each other. You know, typically, Folks who work in these different areas, they don't interact, they don't attend conferences. In a lot of departments, some of these are actually separate departments, you know, the pure math versus the plat math paradigm. But in all of us working together, all from different backgrounds, wanting to learn this new material, I started to realize two things about myself. One, I can work around people that I really enjoy working with. And two, I was actually smart enough that I could learn a different area. I didn't just have to pigeonhole myself into this one area if I didn't like it. So the year I went up for tenure, I got a very different mindset to doing mathematics. 
Now, what I'll say is that over the next six, seven years, from about 2010 to about 2017, I definitely learned a lot more about this area. But because it was such a new area that most people had not worked in before, this meant that I didn't really have other people I could talk to. So when people came to Purdue to give talks, you know, in the seminar that I was running, they weren't visiting me to give a talk in this specific area, this idea of belly maps and descend on thoughts. I was working in an area where I was really working primarily by myself. You know, I still wanted to learn more about number theory in general, which is why I didn't mind people coming to Purdue to give talks in all these different areas. But really me working in this one area by myself gave me a newfound sense of independence. So now I'll say when the opportunity came up for me to go to Pomona in 2017, there wasn't really this fear of saying I was going to go to a place where I was no longer going to be in a research environment. Because over the last six, seven years before that, I had learned to work more or less independently. You know, to do things like, if I see a definition that I don't understand, being able to flip through different books and different papers to try to piece it together. Or just almost like going down a rabbit hole. If there was something I really wanted to understand, I might look up this one word on Wikipedia, do a couple of links that'll eventually lead to this other word. That would lead to a series of papers that would tell me about this conference of people working in this totally different related, but different set of ideas. And I would just, just kind of learn to piece together all of these things completely on my own. Um, it's been a very different way of doing mathematics from the way I was trained as a grad student and as a postdoc. You know, during my postdoc years, the idea was I was working on this conjecture. A lot of people had an interest in understanding this conjecture. That meant I could attend conferences and give talks. And whenever I would go to these places, there might be 10, 20 people who are really deeply interested in my thoughts on this conjecture. Now think nowadays, I work on a problem where there might be five people on the planet total that are really interested in what I'm working in. So it's very different. In fact, nowadays, when I go to conferences, I'm talking about a topic that no one in the room has even heard of before. So it's, it's a very, very different way of doing math. But I will say I'm happier doing this math now than I ever was doing any math before then. Edry, to what extent is that a function of you being established in the field, which might accord you a level of adventurousness in your intellectual curiosity that might not be available for a postdoc or an assistant professor? That, that's a good question, and I'm not really sure what the answer is. Um, it is true that when I was a postdoc, because I was working on a problem that was very popular, you know, something that people really wanted to know about, it did give me the opportunity to get to know people in my field. You know, I probably averaged around 20 academic talks a year when I was a postdoc. That meant that I probably gave on the order of 60, 70 talks within about five years or so. So I traveled anywhere and everywhere. Um, when I was at Caltech from 2001 to 2004 as a postdoc, I probably gave a talk at every math department at a research university in Southern California. You know, I just, just got to know everyone. Um, that those contacts that I made then certainly help now when I'm asked to sit on committees, serve on panels with the National Science Foundation. You know, these are just people that I've just known because of the talks that I gave when I was a postdoc. On the other hand, I did take a huge risk in 2010 when I decided to switch fields because a lot of people really wondered what is this going to mean for the number theory group at Purdue? You know, I was no longer working in this really hot area of Galois representations and Artemis conjecture. I'm working on this field that no one had ever heard of before, belly maps and how these things are all related to like branch covers of Riemann surfaces. So certainly it was very risky when I decided to switch fields because yes, it is true. I had some level of seniority because I had done a postdoc, I already had a tenure track position, but I didn't have tenure yet. And I still think in a lot of ways, this delayed me getting promoted 
to full professor because I did switch fields. I certainly saw some individuals who were younger than me, some individuals who started after I started at Purdue, who made it up the ranks much faster in the 14 years that, that I was there. I was told by a couple of colleagues that they were going to delay my making full professor because of the lack of publication, because of the lack of grants. And yes, probably the lack of publications and the lack of grants came from me switching fields. But you know, it doesn't really feel good to kind of know that regardless of the math that you've done in the past, that they're kind of looking at the math you're currently doing and they're going to kind of slow your promotion based on these factors of them thinking that, you know, you're not really being as productive as they would like you to be. So I, I certainly had to suffer through the consequences of switching fields almost mid-career, you know, kind of going from being an assistant professor to an associate to a full professor, right when I was going to make that transition from assistant to associate. You know, I think that that's what slowed down the next transition from associate to full because of this, this change of fields. Andre, again, these conversations are such a wonderful opportunity to convey to a non-technical audience how mathematicians go about their work. So when you're working in a field where, as you say, literally, there might only be five people in the whole world who are interested in it, who understand at your level what it is you're working on, take me through the the intellectual process. How do you get there? What What's the wormhole? What does that look like to get to that level of rarefied scholarship? Well, you know, most of us, when we take classes, let's say in college, you know, we see things like calculus and sometimes we're told, well, calculus has been around for almost 400 years. You know, Isaac Newton did certain things, Gottfried Leibniz did other things. There are some other people over the years that maybe kind of worked out some results, but most of us think of math as being static, something that was created 400 years ago and that's it, no new math has ever been created since then. When you take higher level math courses, these are courses in topics such as number theory, discrete mathematics, abstract algebra, differential geometry, and you know, all these fancy phrases, you start to realize that math isn't so static, that even new math is being created literally every single day. One of the issues we have as mathematicians is trying to keep track of all of the new mathematics that's being created. Now, when I say keep track, most of the time when students learn math, they sit there in a class. And in this class, they have a professor at the chalkboard writing these things down, and this is how students learn. But if you're a professor, where do you learn this? How do you figure out what's the new stuff that maybe somebody just invented yesterday or the day before? This is the concept of having a seminar on your campus or having a conference that takes place semi-periodically, once every so many years. When you are a professor, you want to have faculty members at other schools that will come to your campus and almost like they give a class. This is the idea of a seminar. You as a professor sit in the room, you have your pen and paper, you're ready to take notes, and this colleague of yours, this professor at another campus, goes to the chalkboard and they give a class, they give a talk on the new math that they just invented a few weeks before. And it's it's a great experience because it's almost like you never left school. You know, you're, you're learning this brand new stuff that this person just created and you're one of the only people in the world that actually knows that this is brand new math that's just being created. Um, similar things happen at these conferences. But it's, it's on a larger scale. Instead of it maybe having 20 professors in one room there on your campus, you might have an order of 100 or maybe even 1,000 people in a room watching this person give a talk that's about the brand new mathematics that they just created. Now, if someone who's just created this new math gives enough talks, then there are a good number of people around the country, around the world even, they start to learn what this person's doing. And then they become very interested in learning more about what this person's doing. So they start a series of emails, conversations, collaborations. They may work on papers together. They may talk with the person more and more to ask this person to run like a summer school 
or to run a week-long workshop. But, you know, this is really how mathematics is being built up as a community, that the more people learn about a certain area, the more they become interested in the new math a certain group of people is working on, the larger that group grows. There's a plus side and a downside to this, though. The plus side is mathematics is really done almost like a, a community sport. You know, when one person starts to explain what they do, more people become interested in it. And then this means that you have now a cohort of people that are really interested in a very specific area. So math kind of grows organically in, in this way. You know, you have conferences, you have seminars, you have workshops. All of this is totally outside of the classroom, but this is how the community engages itself and gets to kind of promote new mathematics. The downside is who's encouraged to be in the room when this new math is being discussed. Um, as humans are known to do, you have cliques that form. Sometimes people's personalities kind of govern who really is allowed to be in the room and who isn't. Um, and this means that you may have areas that say aren't as diverse as they could be. Some areas are known to have not have any women that are involved. Some areas are known to actually have more women than men. Some areas have no minorities. Some areas have a predominantly strong group of minorities. But you do have these issues now of certain areas of math that now are really determined based on the culture of the people that are doing the math. And that kind of creates silos in the field. Now, a lot of what I'm saying here isn't just unique to mathematics. You know, it does happen more generally in STEM fields, more generally even in other academic disciplines. But since I'm a mathematician, you know, this is definitely, these are things that I've seen for years and years. Some of it I do like about math, but others of it, you know, give me pause. They really make me wonder, is, is, is math really all that it could be? How unique is Pomona as a place where you could achieve the things that you wanted to achieve, right? In other words, from the outside looking in, were there any number of top tier, small, four year liberal arts kinds of colleges that could have served as an ideal place for you to do this? Or was there something really special and unique about what Pomona was doing then and at that time? There was something unique and special about Pomona. Um, 2016, 2017, when I was at Purdue, I knew that I wasn't happy and I knew that I had to leave. It was really weighing on my health, weighing on my spirit, and, and I just knew something had to change. But I needed to weigh what were all of the factors that were very important to me to convince me to leave. You know, being at a place like Purdue, you can argue I'm making a good salary. Things are OK living in Indiana. I had a house. I had a research program. But you can also argue that I wasn't really feeling respected in the number theory group that was there at Purdue. I certainly didn't feel that I could have any real social life living in West Lafayette, Indiana, you know, just a very small city kind of in the middle of nowhere. But I started to wonder if I were to move to a different city, a different school altogether, how many of those factors would remain? What if I went to a department where, again, I didn't really get along with the number theory folks in the department because of you know, personality conflicts and what have you. What if I moved to a really small city again and I felt that I wouldn't really have a good social life? So I really had to figure out what were the very important factors for me. And I started to think, I wanted to be in a department where I could interact very specifically with Black undergraduates, a department where I could really encourage Black students to major in mathematics, possibly even to get PhDs in mathematics. I wanted to be in a department where I could run an RU, but a very powerful RU, where I would not only have outside funding to do this, but I would have a lot of institutional support. You know, if I needed money to have like a slush fund so that I could hire grad students as TAs, or have money so that I could print posters, hire on another undergraduate at the last minute if I needed to, would that department, with the campus more generally, give me that institutional support that I needed? 
would I have colleagues that would also feel very strongly about the importance of diversity and the importance of having a welcoming department that would have women and minorities alike to feel, yes, they really wanted to major in mathematics because of the culture that was there. But I also had to think of more shallow things like, could I live in a city where I would have a social life? What about living in a city where maybe I could go see movies? Because movies for me was a really, really important thing. Could I live in a city where the weather would be great and I wouldn't have to worry about driving in the snow? You know, th there were just a list of all of these factors that were very important to me. Now, thinking of all of those factors, I could come up with maybe two schools in the country where I would feel comfortable. And remember, I had traveled around a lot to give talks, to interact with people, to attend conferences, to run conferences. So I had a pretty good idea of the different types of schools there were in the country. And I really thought very seriously about going to another research one university like Purdue or the different types of liberal arts colleges that were around or even going to a historically black college university in HBCU. But I thought very carefully about all of these different departments and what parts of the country I could go to. I could tell you that it came down to two campuses. I would consider either Pomona College or I would consider Howard University. Now, Pomona College is about as different from Purdue as you can get. You know, Purdue has around 40,000 students. Pomona has 1,600 students. Um, the endowment at Pomona is actually larger than the endowment at Purdue. The city that Pomona is located in is actually in Los Angeles County, and there are more people in LA County than there are in the entire state of Indiana. So, you know, you can't get any, di any more different between Pomona and Purdue. But then I also thought about Howard University. It's historically black college. It's in the middle of Washington, DC. It's a beautiful large city. I would be able to live in a nice metropolitan area where I would have a social life. It's a research one university. I think technically it's a research two university now, but the point is that it's still research intensive. I know a lot of the faculty there. It will be a great place to work with black undergraduates consider convincing them to go into mathematics and eventually get their PhDs in mathematics. So there was this serious draw of me wondering which of the two should I consider going to because of this long list of factors. Pomona eventually won out because I really liked the idea of being at a smaller school where I would get to know everyone. Um, I really loved that about Caltech and that feeling of being at a smaller school where you would get to know all of the students and all of the faculty and all of the staff, that never went away for me. Um, and I'll say being at Pomona now, it reminds me a lot of my undergraduate days. You know, I, I love the fact that the classes are small as they are. And students, you know, you get to know each and every one of them. I have an order of 15, 20 students every semester. When I have office hours, students can just come in and we can just chat about random things. Um, when I walk across campus, you know, I get to wave hello to students that I know. I also get to wave hello to my colleagues and faculty members from all these different departments. And just knowing that it's a small enough campus that we do have a strong community. That for me was, was a huge, huge draw. I don't know if I would have found the same tight-knit community if I had gone to a larger school like Howard University. But I will say that, that for me, knowing that I have everything that I would have wanted in a school and more is what made Pomona win out. Was there anybody on the faculty at Pomona, either on the research side or on the more activist side that you saw as a partner or the administration of Pomona where you thought the kinds of things that you want to accomplish, Pomona is providing an infrastructure to accomplish them? I'll say yes, yes, and yes. Um, one of the faculty members that I was leading some of these research groups with, you know, I mentioned that in summer 2010, I led a research group at, in Providence, Rhode Island, where we were learning about these belly maps 
for the first time. There was another individual there who was also leading one of those groups named Stefan Garcia. And he's a faculty member here at Pomona. He doesn't do number theory. He more does what's called C-star algebras, but he's been known to publish papers in number theory. Stefan approached me a few times after summer 2010 just to ask, might I be interested in coming to Pomona? Every time he asked, I said no. Um, he would eventually convince me that because I would come to the Los Angeles area to visit family for Christmas, for Thanksgiving, maybe I could just come by and visit the department. Um, I didn't realize that this was kind of a thinly veiled attempt at an interview, but still just in kind of visiting and meeting people in the department, I realized that these were people that I really liked and that I could possibly see myself working with. Still, I decided, did not want to move to a liberal arts. I still wanted to try to make things work at a research one university. So even after I visited people in the department, you know, I just decided it, it probably was not going to be a good fit. Another person I got to know very well is Amy Radinskaya. We got to know each other in a very different way because I was president of the National Association of Mathematicians starting in 2015. This is the nationwide group of black mathematicians. She became president of the Association for Women in Mathematics, I believe in maybe 2016, 2017, somewhere around there. This meant that we were on various committees together and got to know each other very, very well. But now this is more like on the activist side of things. We would work together in trying to find ways specifically to promote black women in mathematics. So this meant that Pomona now had two individuals that I had gotten to know outside of Pomona. Stefan Garcia, more in the realm of research, but specifically working with faculty members, faculty of color, to get them to get back into doing research in math. And then there was Amy, who I was getting involved with more of these activists in mathematics ideas by saying, let's get more involved with Blacks in mathematics, with women in mathematics, so when I realized that they were both in the same department and that there would be this wonderful synergy if I could work with either of them separately, let alone both of them together, that was a big factor for me to consider Pomona. Now, of course, there's other people in the department that I've known in different ways, but I'm going to say that those two individuals, Stefan and Amy, they, they were a huge factor for me with Pomona. Edre, because so much of your work during your last years at Purdue were supported through grants. What considerations or concerns might there be might there have been about the transferability of those grants since you were no longer going to be at an R1 school? That is an excellent question. That was a big, big factor I was very concerned with. Um, you know, I received this grant from the National Science Foundation so that I could run this research experience for undergraduates, this RU there at Purdue. I had the grant for one year and you know, we ran one wonderful program, but then I had to ask the question, could I transfer the grant over to Pomona? The main issue was this, the way we had written the grant was to say, students were gonna come from all over the country to come to a research one university to spend eight weeks to do research. And we had carefully crafted the grant to say things like, some of the research assistants would be the graduate students there in the department. A lot of the other facilities that we had there, we had classrooms for the students to work with in. We had dorms on campus for the students to live in. So we had to convince the National Science Foundation that if we switched over the grant to Pomona College, it would still have the same resources. It would still have the same facilities. Now there were some serious issues, uh, for example, in order to have a research assistant at Purdue, we would have graduate students. Actually, NSF told us that when we first originally wrote the grant, the amount of money it would take to pay for grad students was so much. We had to worry about like paying tuition and paying health care and all that through the grant. NSF actually told us they weren't going to pay for grad students. So they actually made us take out of the grant paying for grad students. It actually turned out that it wasn't a problem because the math department was paying for the grad students. They were paying tuition. They were paying for health care. So I simply had to negotiate with the math department. Give me two grad students that you're paying for anyway, and I'll just have them do research with my students. 
And the map department said, that was perfectly fine. But now I had to write to NSF to explain, Pomona didn't have grad students because as a liberal arts college, at best it had undergraduates, didn't even have master's students. And I had to tell NSF, I needed to have extra money to pay for whatever students I was going to hire to act as research assistants. I had to be very creative in coming up with a good way to, to do this. The other side was the facilities. You know, Purdue had these great classrooms for students to sit around and do research, other rooms for students to have offices. And I had to prove that Pomona had the same facilities. Ironically, maybe five, six years before I got to Pomona, it had completely renovated the math building so that they had specific rooms designed for students to do research. So in an ironic twist of fate, Pomona actually had better facilities to do research than Purdue ever did. Oh, wow, that's great. <laughs> so, you know, like little things like there specifically is a room set up here at Pomona that will hold, I'll say about 40 undergraduates. There's chalkboards all around. There are lockers for the students to put in their book bags. They have extra movable chalkboards. They have movable desks. Like it is, it is the perfect room for students to do research. They had never actually used the room because Pomona didn't have an RU. So it's, it was just very ironic that when they renovated the building, they had all of these rooms specifically set up for undergraduate research, but they really weren't using the rooms. So in that sense, it was a really easy sell to tell NSF we're moving from a place that had limited resources. I just had to say in the NSF grant, technically I didn't have enough space for offices for my undergraduates at Purdue. Because as you might imagine, all of the offices at Purdue were for the grad students and the visiting faculty members. They had no extra offices for the undergraduates to use. Now you moving to Pomona, there were more than enough resources. You know, most of the faculty at a liberal arts college don't really stay around for the summer. They really want to take the summers off, which meant we had literally the entire building, something like eight classrooms, this one classroom for students to do research in that were not being used at all. So I could put this in, in the, 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 um, the renewal, kind of the, the, the grant that we're going to use to transfer over for the paperwork to explain why we were going to transfer it over, that we actually had better facilities. The only part that I really had to sell was the hiring of the research assistants. But there, I just moved around the numbers a little bit to say I could either hire some graduate students from the Claremont Graduate University, which is literally right next door to Pomona, or I could hire one or two grad students from the local area, because here in Southern California, in the immediate area within like a 30 mile radius, you have Cal State San Bernardino, University of California at Riverside, University of California, or sorry, I'm Cal State Fullerton, the University of Laverne. I mean, you have all of these schools right here. So I could actually make the argument, hiring a grad student will be no more difficult than hiring one at Purdue. So yes, we did actually have to write a report to kind of explain, we wanted to transfer over the grant and here are factors that you might think would be issues, but it's actually better to have it at Pomona than to have it at Purdue. It actually wasn't a problem. Yeah, transferring over the grant was pretty easy after that. Andrea, just on the personal side, was it simply nice to get back to Southern California for you? It, it was. It, it was very nice. Um, you know, I, I still have relatives, friends that live here in the area. Um, a lot of my relatives don't really understand this whole thing of like being in a research one, being in the liberal arts and running RUs and doing research. As far as they're concerned, I'm moving back to Southern California. Yeah. So. A lot of my family was very, very happy that, that I was able to, to come back. Uh, and it, it really has been great that, that I'm you know, kind of able now that I'm coming back more at a senior level. Yeah. You know, I, being at Pomona, I am one of the more senior faculty members here. So I'm coming back with a different level of respect that I think I had when I left back in 2004. And that's, that's very nice. So it's, it really has been great on so many levels coming back. Given the considerations you were talking about, Howard and Pomona and thinking about your options, when you were ready to launch the National Association of Mathematicians Network of Opportunities, 
targeting students and faculty at HBCUs. What were some of the challenges not being at an HBCU yourself? And what were some of the opportunities maybe as an outsider, not directly in the mix of what HBCUs were going through? So let, let me start by saying um, HBCUs historically have not really gotten the respect that, that they deserve. Um, there are roughly 100 HBCUs in the country. They're either 101 or 103, depending on how you count. And a lot of them do have financial issues. Uh, most of your HBCUs are run based on government subsidies. And the government really hasn't been great about giving HBCUs the money that they need to do what they want to do. Um, your HBCUs really do overperform based on the resources that they have. Um, if I remember the numbers right, roughly only about 30% of all Black students who go to college go to HBCUs. So this means that the majority of Black students who attend college are not at HBCUs. And of course, I was one of those students who did not attend an HBCU. However, if you take a look at the Black students who get their PhDs, in STEM, science, technology, education, math, I believe it's maybe 40 to 50 percent of those PhDs come from students who have an undergraduate degree from an HBCU. So HBCUs are overperforming when it comes to producing students who eventually get their PhDs in the STEM fields. I was always fascinated by that number. I mean, even just to make it very, very concrete, a lot of people ask me about Blacks who are going to get their PhDs in mathematics at some of your top fancier schools. And you could say getting a PhD at like your Stanford's or let's say Princeton's, Harvard's, Berkeley, what have you. And a lot of people would tell me in order to get to those fancy PhD programs, you have to have a degree from one of those fancy schools like a Caltech, a Stanford and what have you. The problem is that's not true. You know, you could take a look and ask a really simple question. How many Black students who've gotten math degrees from Caltech have gone on to these fancy schools? The problem is Caltech doesn't graduate Blacks in mathematics. I believe in the history of the Institute, there are maybe five Blacks that have gotten their, their, their undergraduate degrees in math. Five. PhDs, I believe that there's only ever been one. But if we just focus on undergraduates that have gone on to get their PhDs, there have been max five in the history of the Institute. Now, I know places like Morehouse College, which is an all men's HBCU there in Atlanta, Spelman College, all women's HBCU also in Atlanta, they have done an incredible job of getting Black students to get degrees at places like Berkeley, University of Chicago. You know, I can just like go down the list of all these schools where you have students that have gotten their degrees at these smaller liberal arts colleges, and they're not doing great work all around the country. So something's to be said for being a Black student at Morehouse versus being a Black student at Caltech. Why is it that Morehouse has produced more PhDs in math than Caltech ever has. Like no one ever wants to look at that, but th this is something that, that's just struck me for years and years. That for me is, is a fascinating concept. So I wanted to be more involved with HBCUs just to learn from them, what are they doing right? And what's Caltech doing wrong? This meant that on the one hand, I had to spend a lot of time in HBCUs just getting to know about the culture, about what the faculty go through, what the students go through, a lot about the history, just all of these things. And the more I learned about it, the more I wanted to be involved in running conferences at HBCUs so that you would have faculty members from all over the country, some faculty members who are also at other HBCUs, some that are at predominantly white institutions at PWIs, so that they could also learn what HBCUs have to offer. Now, I will say that there are pros and cons to doing this. Um, on the one hand, I think it is great for everyone to attend HBCUs just to learn about the culture, about the campus, 
so on and so forth. When I was in high school, people knew about The Cosby Show. But what they didn't know was that there was a spinoff of The Cosby Show called A Different World. Now, A Different World basically took place at an HBCU. I mean, it kind of took place at a fictional HBCU named Hillman College. All of us know they were a thinly veiled attempt of discussing Morehouse and Spellman right there in Atlanta. But, you know, I was in high school. I saw the show. All of my friends in high school, they saw it. And we really had this idealized version of what it meant to be a student at an HBCU. But still, you know, we had this really nice idea that HBCUs were, were the places to be. So I still think to this day that people should go to HBCUs, at least for conferences, to get to know what these schools are like, what they have to offer. On the other hand, though, because I myself am not a product of HBCUs, there were a lot of people that I met that were very wary of me wanting to learn more or me wanting to run conferences there. Um, I think a lot of that stemmed from this worry that HBCUs get a bad rap, you know, that there are these ideas that maybe the students aren't as good, that the classes don't cover as much material, that the money isn't there, that the resources aren't there. You know, a lot of people really have these ideas that HBCUs are less than colleges, you know, that they just aren't up to stuff compared to places like Caltech. But again, as I mentioned before, that doesn't make any sense because why is it that places like Morehouse and Spelman have produced far more PhDs in mathematics than Caltech ever has, you know, when it comes to African-Americans. So yeah, there, there definitely was, maybe in a lot of ways still is, concern that I am not a product and therefore I don't really understand the culture, which I get it, which I understand why the concern is there. But on the other hand, I feel that I myself have learned a lot from HBCUs. I have a lot of respect for faculty members that are there. You know, I still stay. One day I may end up being a faculty member at an HBCU. But it definitely has been a really eye-opening experience to learn a lot more behind just what HBCUs have done for, for the math culture. Edre, moving closer to the present, I asked you about your experiences during the Rodney King beating and the subsequent riots in Los Angeles last year with the murder of George Floyd and all of the feelings and sentiments that that tragic event and so many others brought to the fore. For you, for what you were trying to do, what, what opportunities did you see in that moment as people were thinking about these things and as they were grasping for ways to make the situation better. In what ways did you see opportunity for all of the things that you had been working on up to that point? There were a lot of opportunities that, that I saw. Um, let's say maybe the year before everything kind of went down. I spent a lot of time trying to get the word out about the National Association of Mathematicians. NAM was formed in January of 1969 where there were 13 individuals that said they were fed up with not being listened to, not being respected, not being allowed to attend conferences, even stay in some of the hotels that were segregated at the time. There was just this, this real feeling of something had to change, something had to be different. In 2019, NAM celebrated its 50th anniversary. And I wanted to really get out the history of the organization, not just to say, here are some of the reasons why NAM had formed, but really to delve deeply to say, here are many, many racist incidents that have happened in our math community. We all need to know the history of all of these. Now, I don't know how much of that was really listened to in 2019. Um, some people paid attention to this, but there were a lot of individuals who just thought, well, that happened 50 years ago. It's not the same way now. Things are much better now. And it was really frustrating to try to get out the current numbers to explain things like the number of Black students getting PhDs has been steadily stagnant over the last 50 years. In fact, over the last three, four years or so, the number of Black undergraduates getting their math degrees 
has been decreasing. So you can actually argue that things have been getting worse over the last several years. And again, this was 2019, you know, me giving talks for the 50th anniversary of NAM on what had happened with Blacks over the last 50 years in mathematics, roughly 1969 to 2019. I probably gave about 10 talks that year. And again, it wasn't really clear to me how many people had really listened to this. Now fast forward to summer 2020 with George Floyd. It was like night and day. All of a sudden you had individuals who wanted to talk about race and racism in this country and what had been happening with police brutality and why things are so horrible for black Americans. It was almost like living in a twilight zone. You know, like the year before, I had been preaching all of this for months and months. A lot of it fell on deaf ears. Now here it is a year later, and I have people emailing me to say they wanted to hear about what's happening with Blacks in mathematics and what's happening with police brutality. And I just couldn't figure out where were all of these people six, 12 months before. Um, it gave me a unique opportunity as president of NAM to say there were a couple of things I could do, but I really had to do some soul searching to figure out were these opportunities I was willing to, to take. So on the one hand, there was like this teachable moment to be able to say, yes, what happened with George Floyd was horrible, but let's look very close to home of what's happening in the mathematics community. And there a lot of us really tried to kind of tie in some of the current events with more of the historical events to say, if you're black in this country, it's not as simple to say that you are black and you are a mathematician. Those you cannot separate. You just can't say you're a mathematician, you have to worry about writing papers, getting grants or what have you. And then you kind of switch and maybe you have to worry about police brutality and racism and what have you. Um, there were stories that several of us gave of people who say were attending math conferences, but still, harassed by security because of the police brutality surrounding the city or maybe what was happening there at the conference site. So we did use this as a teachable moment to say, you can't separate the two, that if you are black and if you're a mathematician, you have to figure out how to negotiate these two worlds at the same time. In a more exploitative way, for lack of a better word, I also realized that people wanted to do something with their dollars. And so I used this as an opportunity to fundraise for now. Um, you know, up to that point, we have been struggling somewhat financially and trying to raise money, having people to pay their dues. And this was more like a infrastructure type of thing. You know, for example, it's easy to maybe send an email to individuals saying, please pay your dues for the year so that that way we'll have so much money coming in from our membership. Well, the problem was we didn't have a great email list. We didn't have a great database of our members and we didn't have an online system for people to actually pay their membership fees. So this is one of the big things I had to do as president, spend a couple of years setting up all of this from scratch. So actually like going in, writing Excel scripts, trying to actually come up with ways so that we would know what our database of members were, literally creating from scratch a website so that people could actually pay their dues. But once we had all of that in place, I decided to use this opportunity of people really wanting to do something to call out a lot of people to say, yes, you can sit around and say that you really want to do something with everything that's happening around George Floyd. What you as a mathematician can do, and I said this to all of my white colleagues over Facebook and other social media, just become a member of NAM. At the bare minimum, you can become a member. Saying that then gave us an influx in memberships and an influx in donations. And I want to say, I don't know the exact numbers, but the organization probably raised on the order of $40,000, $50,000 within a couple of weeks. 
which is insane because I think that we had raised maybe 40, 50,000 in like the three years I had been president up to that point. So it, we raised a lot of money doing that. Um, and again, it's, it's not clear to me whether that's exploitative or it's just kind of using the moment. Um, I do know that the organization was able to do a lot of good with that money. Um, and it was money that the organization really sorely needed to do good. So I think that there may be a couple of different ways to think about the opportunities that, that we had then, but still, I was pretty happy that we were able to use that time as both a teachable moment and it's like just a financial fundraiser to help the organization work. Edre, being back in Southern California and having the perspective yourself of, you know, your experiences at Caltech earlier and many of the ways in which Caltech might have been tone deaf, where there might not have been the infrastructure to support you and people that came from your kind of background. Were you paying attention at all to any of the efforts that Caltech was making to address those concerns? Have you been keeping tabs? Has it been making good progress as far as you're concerned? I had definitely been keeping tabs of things. Um, you know, I had only come back to campus a couple of times for some of the events. When I got back in 2018, there was discussion of having maybe a display on Black alumni. And I forget when it was, it may have been roughly early spring of 2019 when this display happened there on campus. So I was kind of around for that. And I know that there was a lot more discussion and maybe wanting Caltech to be more visible about featuring its Black alumni. In the same way, I had heard that the students, specifically the Black graduate students, were spending a bit more time trying to get Caltech to address some of the historical racism, maybe hiring more faculty, increasing the number of undergraduates that were there on campus, having minority student affairs to have more money so that they could do more fun, uh, more programming. So I've been hearing all of these things kind of grumbling through um, the networks. Um, I started a Black alumni Facebook group maybe 10 years ago. So a few of us have been posting there just to kind of keep track of various things that, that were happening. But I definitely was hearing some things that were happening on campus. I'm not going to say that I attended any meetings on campus about a lot of this. But there were certainly enough grumblings with some of the Black alumni that I could hear what was going on. Um, I can say that I did contact Sarah Sam once or twice. Mm -hmm. So she was one of the Black graduate students that was involved with this group called Black, Black Ladies at Caltech, BLAC. She also was one of the few students, I believe probably the only Black student, that was on this renaming committee. Um, you know, of course, there was all this publicity about her resigning in protest, and, and I did email her a little bit, kind of figure out kind of what was happening and whether the Black alumni could do more to kind of support her there. Uh, but I can't say that I understood all of the fine details of things that were happening at Caltech. Um, I will say that when I first got back in 2018, I was very skeptical that Caltech would change. But, you know, this skepticism was founded on me being an undergraduate for years, me being a postdoc for three years, me coming back as a staff member running FSI for one summer, and then even me interviewing alumni going as far back as the 1950s to see how much had changed over the years. And the unanimous answer over all of these different experiences was Caltech will never change. I will say over the last maybe three years, maybe I've been wrong about that. You know, it does feel that Caltech has made some changes. I still have a wait and see attitude to see how many more, but I have been very happy to see the number of black faculty at Caltech is larger than it ever has been. I think the numbers might be maybe eight black faculty now. Um, the number of black undergraduates at Caltech is larger than it ever has been. Caltech just admitted its largest black freshman class ever, which I believe is maybe sitting at 30, 40 students. I'm not, not quite sure. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful with what I've been seeing. Where I have a hesitance about this is I've seen similar things in the past where 
there been made, there's been some progress, but then based on any number of factors, faculty members decide to leave, undergrads decide to transfer, and that progress that's been made drops off. And the numbers, while they look good to start with, eventually drop to zero. You know, when I started in 1990, I believe there were maybe 14 black students that came in. The year after me, 1991, I believe that there were maybe 12 black students that came in. By 1996, I think it was, the Chronicle of Higher Education featured zero black students in the freshman class. And I wanna say that that happened maybe a second time in maybe like the year 2000, 2001, something like this. So I'm saying that early 1990s, there was this feeling of Caltech is making a change, Caltech is getting better. And then a decade later, we had all these reports to say Caltech had zero black students in his freshman class. So I'm optimistic that Caltech is making changes now. I've been seeing a lot of internal discussions there on campus with the staff, with the faculty, even with the president. But it's this, this hesitance of I've seen this before, and I'm just curious how much of this is going to stick. Andre, back to the grant supported research, the Pomona research in mathematics experience that was previously NSF funded and now is NSA funded. I wonder if the takeaway there is that you saw these infrastructure availabilities at Pomona mm -hmm. and, and you've really been able to, to build this dream of yours of making a powerhouse research environment at a very small school that can be supported not just by one federal agency, but by two. I wonder if that's sort of the broad scale takeaway in terms of what you've been able to achieve and what you hope to build on going into the future. That, that is a good question. Um, you, you know, I had to think big picture of how do I want to scale up what I want to do? And th this, this has just made like some insight and just how I decided to play more of a political financial game here. I knew that I could transfer the grant from Purdue University to Pomona College. And that was the NSF grant. Now, there were roughly two more years left on that grant. Um, we got the grant, I guess, in 2016. So we ran the summer program for the first time in summer 2016. Um, actually, we ran it for the first time, I believe, summer 2017. When I got to Pomona, I decided to not run the program summer 2018. So then technically the last year of the grant was say summer 2019. I decided to try to extend the grant for one year just because we had a lot of money left over. So technically we really ran the grant for the last time summer 2020. But by then I started to think I want to expand things, expand them greatly. The grant that we had up to that point was around $350,000. But I decided I wanted to ask for much more money and ask for about a million dollars from NSF. Even I realized that that was kind of ambitious to literally triple the amount of money that you're asking for to run a much more expanded program. So I thought, why don't I have a backup plan? So I said, let me apply for money from a second agency just in case so that I'll have the money. And if things don't work out with NSF, I can apply a second time. And then hopefully second time's a charm, everything will work out. So as we closed out the funding from the NSF grant, the one that I got back in 2016, I applied for funding through the NSA, the National Security Agency. That was supposed to be a two-year grant as a backup. But it was gonna be the same thing that we had done with Prime from before, have a group of students on campus, all do research, so on and so forth. Um, so we got the grant from NSA, that's the current grant that we have now. But while we were waiting on that grant, I applied for the big, big NSA grant, roughly for the million dollars. Much to my surprise, we got the NSF grant. We didn't get it for a million dollars. We got it for almost $600,000, but that's the big grant now that I'm gonna use to expand Prime from the way it is. So it does look a little bit weird that I kind of started with the National Science Foundation grant, moved over to a National Security Agency grant, and now I'm going back to a National Science Foundation. But that's all because it was just part of like this big political plan. Just me thinking, 
there are these different agencies out there. Why don't I just apply for funding from all of them and just see what happens? So I felt very, very fortunate that, that this all has, has worked out. What, what I'll say is Pomona has been really great in being very supportive about a lot of these things. Um, you know, it, it's not easy to write a grant. It's not as simple as you just kind of write ideas down on paper and you send it off to this government agency and some people look at it and then they put a stamp on it saying, this is a great idea, we're going to give you money. It doesn't work like that at all. You have to worry about the internal paperwork of how all this happens. So for example, I had to write a 15 page document that outlines why we're going to do this. We had to look up the literature and look up the numbers of how many minorities are getting their PhDs in mathematics, um, the historical trends and then the current trends. We also had to explain the actual research the students were going to do <clears throat> and talk about like the more general experience. So bringing in outside speakers and taking them on field trips and what are the facilities that they have, have here on campus? What about the classrooms that they're going to use? <coughs> Excuse me. And we then had to talk about, really, historically, has what we've done in the past actually made a difference? That's meant I had to track down all of the students that I've ever worked with, figure out how many of them have gone off to grad school, what grad schools they went to, what kind of degrees do they have, so I really needed to say, in all of the work that we've done over the years, here's the impact that the program has made. So this is a lot of work you have to do to put together all of this document. It really just isn't as simple as, they're gonna do math, give us money. But you know, you really have to kind of explain, here's why we're doing this, and here's the impact it's going to make, plus here's the impact that it's made in the past. Even on top of that, you have to worry about the numbers and how the numbers are going to match up with what's happening at Pomona. You have what's called overhead costs. So Pomona actually gets a little bit of its own money on top of the money that, that I get. So this means that Pomona gets something out of this too. In me getting all of these external grants, Pomona also gets money. And some of this is used to help pay for the staff that's here on campus. I know that I use some of this extra money to kind of help pay for some other little things like buying t-shirts for the students. So, you know, th there's also some extra perks that Pomona itself gets out of getting these, these grants. But it's, it's like a, a symbiotic relationship. You know, with Pomona helping me to get all these grants, there's great things that I can do for the students. But in me getting these grants, I get to help out the larger Pomona community and actually helping to pay for some of the staff members that are here, people I'm never going to see, but they're still kind of helping me behind the scenes. Edre, your other grants that are currently in process that emphasize the term African diaspora. I wonder if the takeaway there is that with these grants, you're emphasizing that greatness in black uh, mathematics goes beyond the United States, that there is an African math, an African diaspora mathematics community really all over the world, and that you have your set, your site set globally on what they've been able to achieve. That, that's right. That's definitely right. Um, when it comes to working with students, it's a little bit tricky because, say, a lot of your federal funding agencies, National Science Foundation, National Security Agency, they typically restrict the funds to U.S. citizens. So I may have students that are from the diaspora, that they are from other countries, but I need to have students who are currently working in this country. That being said, I can still do programs for faculty members that doesn't really depend upon, say, country of origin or even the country that they're working in now. Um, I've been working with the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute, MSRI, that's up in Berkeley, California. There we put together a program that focuses on encouraging Black faculty, faculty from the African diaspora, to continue to build their research programs. This means they come into MSRI for two weeks. They're working in these research ensembles, probably about four to six individuals, other Black faculty, and they're all working together to do research. Um, I have been seeing incidents where Black faculty more generally would like to do research, but maybe they aren't feeling as welcome in certain research communities. They might feel shunned, let's say, if they attend a conference. Um, 
they're rarely invited to give talks, part of these big invited addresses at some of these workshops, which means that there are more and more Black faculty that I've been seeing over the years that, that don't have the opportunity to showcase their work as many of their white colleagues do. You know, as I was saying earlier today, the way that mathematics really works is new math is being created all the time. And for this new math to be exposed, people really do need to give talks at seminars and conferences and at workshops. Well, if you aren't being invited to give talks at seminars, conferences, and workshops, no one knows the kind of mathematics that you're doing. This is just the way math, the math community works. You have to be invited so that people know the kind of math that you're doing. So I've been working with the MSRI to help remedy this, to make sure that you have faculty members from the African diaspora that are now working together in groups, building up their research programs so that now they're going out to give talks, to talk about their research so that more people actually know what it is they're working on. So as part of this whole project, we have a session that takes place at the largest math conference here in the country. It's called the Joint Mathematics Meetings, where we ask the alum from our research group to give talks here at the session. This means that at this Joint Math Meetings, where there are around 5,000 to 6,000 mathematicians, we have about 20 or so faculty from the African diaspora, people who were a part of this research group, to get up and give talks on the research that they've been working on for the last several years. So I personally love doing this because it really does give Black faculty from all over the world the opportunity to talk about the research that they've been working on. Um, <clears throat> I will say that, that I have really been trying to think more about the international community, what Black mathematicians all over the world go through. Um, one individual that I've been learning a lot from is named Naira Chamberlain. Um, he's over in England. He's actually from Jamaica originally, but he's been a huge proponent in Blacks from all over the world who do mathematics. He's been running this conference for the last several years in England called the Heroes, the Black Heroes of Mathematics. Um, Naira was kind enough to invite me to speak in this conference at his initial conference two years ago, but the second conference just took place about a couple of months ago. I believe that Naira plans to run this conference every year. And I love to attend it because, you know, he's featuring Black mathematicians who are not from the U.S. They really are from all over. And these are individuals that I myself would have never been exposed to. There was another conference that I was invited to speak at that was in the Netherlands. And of course, I didn't actually go to the Netherlands. Everything's been virtual conferences over the last couple of years. So unfortunately, I wasn't there. I actually had to present everything um, over my computer. But this conference was supposed to focus on diversity more generally there in the Netherlands, um, especially there in the university system. I asked to speak with the Black undergraduates because I have no idea what it means to be Black, but as part of, say, like a Dutch culture. We had some really interesting conversations. Um, some of the students were telling me that they were, um, they grew up in some of the former Dutch colonies. So for example, Suriname, like, you know, is one colony, former colony that now has a huge influence in Dutch culture. Um, other black students were telling me that they actually grew up in the Netherlands. They're black, grew up in the Netherlands, but because they don't look blonde hair, blue eye, they really aren't treated like they are are a Dutch citizen. So I'm starting to learn that the Black experience really is unfortunately the same all over. You know, in, in chatting with these maybe 20 students or so for about an hour, I honestly thought I was talking with my undergrads at Pomona College. Because, you know, we had some really interesting conversations on what's the term that they like to call themselves? Do they like Black? Is there another term that they prefer to use? When they're there in college, do students consider themselves, just other students consider them to be like students that are from the Netherlands? Do they treat them differently because they're from other countries? What about police brutality? Are they stopped by security when they're there in the cities? I mean, every single thing you can think of 
these students in the Netherlands were telling me exactly the same that I've been hearing here in, in the United States. So, so when I use the phrase African diaspora, I really am understanding that unfortunately there is a universal experience that, that we do experience. And it's, it's been really great for me to learn this over the last couple of years. Edre, one final question to wrap up this excellent series of conversations we've had. Right now and looking into the future, your most recent appointment is at Claremont Graduate University. I wonder in what ways does having access at the graduate level allow you to continue to pursue your own research interests and to broaden out what you're doing for minority students at the graduate level, not just at the undergraduate level? You know, um, a huge factor, there's been a lot of huge factors that convinced me to come to Pomona, but one of the huge factors was having the opportunity to take on graduate students. You know, it, it, it does feel a little bit strange in that, yes, it is true that I left a uni- research one university to go to a liberal arts college, but Pomona is very unique in how it's situated here. There are the five Claremont colleges, you know, Pomona, Pitzer, Scripps, Harvey Mudd, and Claremont um, McKenna, but technically we consider there to be seven Claremont colleges. The extra two would be the um, Theological Seminary and also the Claremont Graduate University. That means every faculty member that's at one of the five C's can be an affiliate faculty at CGU. So this means I can take on grad students, I can teach graduate level courses. And you know, when I realized that I had the opportunity to do that when I moved here, you know, that just convinced me, like, you know, it's, it's just the perfect situation. So it looks on the surface like I no longer have the opportunity to kind of teach graduate level courses and to take on grad students. But that's actually not true at all. I think that that's very specifically because of where Pomona is located. I don't know many of the liberal arts colleges in the country that would give you that opportunity mm-hmm. to take on Ph.D. students. But fortunately, Pomona does happen. Um. I have been trying to think about a much larger picture, and this is just me almost kind of talking off the top of my head because I really haven't figured all of this out. You know, coming from Purdue, there's a lot of people who do want to listen to the experiences that I had having graduate students, serving on the graduate admissions committee, reading graduate applications, and also now, working with undergraduates, trying to prepare them for graduate programs. I want to find a way to leverage that by being an affiliate faculty at the Claremont Graduate University, but more importantly, realizing that I do have a lot of these contacts in the Research One math community. Um, For example, one thing I've been talking with some R1 faculty with recently is this idea of maybe holding a panel discussion where we would have directors of graduate studies at various R1s to come to a place like Pomona College to sit in a room and tell students, here's what we are looking for when we read grad school applications. Um, I don't know if that's really ever been number four, at least in the mathematics community. You know, typically you would have maybe some former grad students, or I should say former undergraduates who are now in their grad school programs, they may come back to Pomona and talk about when they applied to grad school and about that whole experience. But there's always this general uneasiness of nobody in the room really knows what grad schools are looking for when they read applications. In the same way, a lot of your research ones, they've never worked at liberal arts colleges. So they have no idea what undergraduates at liberal arts colleges, what they're going through, the classes that they've taken, some of the questions that they have about applying to grad schools. So I've been wondering, what if you get those two groups together in the same room? You know, some of the faculty who are at R1s to now talk to undergrads who will be applying to the grad programs, and some of the undergrads who are applying to grad programs now talking with some of these faculty. What if they can all get together in the room at the same time and talk about this whole experience? So I'm, I'm really thinking that I can kind of use my unique experience now in both worlds to do things like that that 
have never been done before, to my knowledge. But I feel really fortunate that I think Pomona being here at the seven seas is really the right place to be to do that. You've been on a journey your whole career, and it sounds like finally you're in the perfect spot. I think so. I think <laughs> Andre, yeah. it's been wonderful spending all this time with you. I'm so deeply appreciative that you were able to share all of your insights and perspective. It's going to be a real treasure for the Caltech archive. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your time.